So welcome, my name is Regina Wallace Jones. I am a city council member in the city of East Palo Alto and also a member of the San Mateo County Library's governing board. We're so happy to have you for this author talk with Richard Rothstein. Now I'd like to go over some housekeeping items before we get started. Your microphone and video will be turned off for this webinar. Don't be surprised by that. We'll start with a presentation by Richard, who is the author of The Color of Law, and then we'll follow that with questions from the audience. Please submit your questions in the Q&A found at the bottom of your screen. For those who'd like to access live closed caption for this event because accessibility is so important, click on the CC icon in your Zoom toolbar and then click on show subtitles. That's CC uh, in your Zoom tool toolbar and then click on show subtitles. Now on to the presentation. San Mateo County Libraries is excited to host Richard Rothstein, author of The Color of Law, as the first event in our Equity Author Series. This series will highlight authors who write about equity in housing, immigration, education, and LGBTQIA issues. It's a lot of letters, but everyone has meaning. I'm pleased to be here to introduce Richard. He is a distinguished fellow of the Economic Policy Institute, the Thurgood Marshall Institute of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and of the Haas Institute at the University of California. Last week when we were practicing, Richard was on the East Coast. He may still be there now, but we are so grateful for his time. And I know having read his book, that we will also be grateful to both better understand what he's written about and more importantly, understand how we as participants can take that learning and try to create a new context for the Bay Area and for this country. Richard, I welcome you. Thank you very much, Regina. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but you've taken yourself off of video. So you might want to turn it back on so we can see you too. There you Okay, go. there I am. Okay, well, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I, um, I've been to San Mateo a number of times <laughs> on video as well as in person. And uh, I hope that some of you are um, return attendees, you won't be bored by hearing the same message twice. I'm going to talk about history and the history doesn't change from one lecture to another. <laughs> so here we go. Um, let me begin by saying, as I often do, uh, that the, in the 20th century, we had a civil rights movement in this country. It began by uh, challenging segregation in law schools and colleges and universities beginning in the 1930s. And then by 1954 was powerful enough to persuade the Supreme Court to prohibit uh, legal segregation in elementary and secondary schools. And that Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954 gave inspiration to a movement of activists, civil rights activists who engaged in marches, demonstrations, civil disobedience. People um, lost their lives in that struggle, but by the end of the 1960s, the civil rights movement had pretty much persuaded much of the country, not everybody, but much of the country, that racial segregation was wrong. It was immoral. It was harmful both to African-Americans and to whites. It was incompatible with our self-conception as a constitutional democracy. How could it be? We um, got this understanding nationwide by most people. With it, we um, abolished segregation in everything from public accommodations to public transportation to employment in many cases. 
1968, in the wake of the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, we um, got a fair housing law passed that prohibited ongoing discrimination in the sale and rental of housing. And then the civil rights movement ended, went home, left untouched the biggest segregation of all. And that is that every metropolitan area in this country is residentially segregated. I've lived in many of them. Every one that I've lived in was clearly segregated. Neighborhoods that were either all white or mostly white, neighborhoods that were either all African-American or mostly African-American. Puzzling. We came to the conclusion that racial segregation was wrong, immoral, harmful to both black and whites, blacks and whites, incompatible with our self-conception as a democratic society, and yet we left untouched the biggest segregation of all. What's the explanation? Well, partly it's because desegregating neighborhoods is hard. If we pass an ordinance prohibiting segregation in restaurants or in trains or buses, the next day you can go to any restaurant you want or sit anywhere you want on the train. But if we pass a law prohibiting segregation in neighborhoods, the next day things wouldn't look much different. So what we've done, all of us, and I mean all of us, blacks and whites, liberals, conservatives, northerners, southerners, Easterners, Westerners, we've adopted a national rationalization, an excuse we give ourselves to um, fail to address the biggest segregation of all. And that excuse, that rationalization goes something like this. We tell ourselves that the segregation that we abolished in the 20th century of colleges and universities and schools and lunch counters and buses, employment, that was all required by government by law, by ordinance, by public policy. If um, the federal government was doing it, it was a violation of the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution, a civil rights violation. As American citizens, we have an obligation to remedy that. If state and local governments were doing it, it was a violation of the 14th Amendment, um, also a civil rights violation. We have an obligation to remedy that. But residential segregation, we tell ourselves, that's something entirely different. That wasn't done by government. That wasn't done by law, by regulation, by public policy. Residential segregation, we tell ourselves, just happened naturally, happened by accident. <clears throat> it happened because some white homeowners and landlords bigoted, refused to sell or rent to African-Americans in white neighborhoods. It happened because Actors in the private economy, businesses, not government, but banks, real estate agencies, developers, insurance companies, discriminated in how they carried out, <coughs> excuse me, their purely private sector activities. Or maybe we tell ourselves that um, it's all because uh, people just like to live with each other of the same race. We feel more comfortable that way. And that's why we have residential segregation. Or maybe it's just economics. Many African-Americans uh, can't afford to move to middle-class white neighborhoods. And that's why we remain segregated. All of these individual, bigoted, private sector, um, non-governmental decisions, self-choices, economic trends, is what created residential segregation. And we tell ourselves that what happened naturally can only unhappen naturally. Most of us, I think, think it's too bad. Uh, we don't like living in an apartheid society, but we don't feel any obligation to do anything about it because it's not a constitutional violation. No civil rights involved. Well, I spent most of my time uh, before I wrote this book, The Color of Law, writing about education policy. I did not, I was not a housing expert. And in the 1990s and 2000s, I devoted a lot of time in my writing to criticizing the dominant education policy of the country. Uh, it was a widely shared view across the political spectrum that the reason that African-American children didn't do as well in school as white children did on average. We called it an achievement gap. 
The reason was that schools didn't try very hard to educate black children. Teachers had low expectations of them. And if only we could force schools to try harder, the achievement gap would disappear. I thought this was a ludicrous theory, but it was, as I say, widely shared Democrats and Republicans. We enacted it into law in 2001 called the No Child Left Behind Law, which required that children be tested every year and that schools be accountable for those test scores. And the law predicted that if we did that, if we tested children every year, held schools accountable, the achievement gap would disappear in seven years. What a stupid idea. It's um, 20 years later, the achievement gap hasn't much budged. And of course it was inevitable that it wouldn't budge because teachers not trying hard enough is a trivial cause of the achievement gap. The main reason we have an achievement gap between African-American and white children in schools today is not because teachers don't try very hard. Some don't, some are bigoted, but that's not the main reason we have an achievement gap. The main reason we have an achievement gap is because so many African-American children living in low-income neighborhoods come to school with social and economic disadvantages that uh, prevent them from taking advantage of what schools have to offer. And so I wrote column after column about this. I was the education columnist at the New York Times uh, during some of this period. And I had a weekly column and I would write column after column explaining why we have an achievement gap. I remember one was about asthma. As you may know, African-American children in low-income uh, neighborhoods in this country have asthma at four times the rate of middle-class children, four times the rate. It's an enormous difference. And the reason they have asthma is they live in more polluted neighborhoods, more trucks driving by their homes, more dilapidated buildings, uh, more vermin in the environment, more empty lots kicking up dust. And if a child has asthma, that child has a greater chance, not in every case, but a greater chance than a child who doesn't have asthma to be up at night wheezing and then coming to school drowsy the next day. And if you have two groups of children identical in every respect, same racial composition, same social and economic background, same family structure, but one group has a higher uh, rate of asthma than the other, that group's gonna have lower average achievements simply because on average, it's gonna be sleepier in school. It doesn't make a big difference. It doesn't explain much of the achievement gap. But then you begin to think of all of the other social and economic conditions that children uh, in segregated low-income neighborhoods come to school with. And you begin to add them up and they make a pretty significant difference. Asthma, lead poisoning has a measurable impact on IQ, homelessness, economic insecurity, add them up and you pretty much explain the achievement gap. It doesn't leave much room of explanation uh, for low teacher expectations. Well, I soon realized this one thing, if a child has asthma or lead poisoning or homelessness or economic insecurity, but what happens when you have a school where every child has one or more of these challenges? How can such a school, no matter how many laws we pass, ever be expected to have the same achievement as a school where children come well-nourished, in good health, well-rested from economically secure homes. Uh, you can't have that expectation, no matter how hard you try uh, to do so. Um, well, we call schools where we concentrate children with those disadvantages, we call them segregated schools. And schools are more segregated today than they ever have been in the last 45 years in this country, more segregated. And they're more segregated because the neighborhoods in which those schools are located are segregated. So I began to think that neighborhood segregation might be an educational problem. I was still thinking about this from the perspective of school improvement. And then I read in 2007, a Supreme Court decision that got me started on this book, The Color of Law. The Supreme Court evaluated two school districts, Seattle, Washington, and Louisville, Kentucky. Both of them had enacted a very trivial, small school desegregation plan. The plan in each district gave parents the choice of which school in the district their child would attend. But if the child was going to, um, child's choice 
the parent's choice was going to intensify a school segregation, that choice wouldn't be honored in favor of the choice of a child who wouldn't do so. So if you had a, an all white and mostly white school and there was one place left and both a black and a white child applied for that last remaining place, black child would be given some preference, help to desegregate the school. This was a trivial program. You don't have one place left in the school very often and you have to choose between a black and a white child. But the Supreme Court evaluated this program, denounced it, said you couldn't do such a thing. The controlling opinion was written by Chief Justice John Roberts. Justice Roberts said that it's true. The schools in Louisville and Seattle are segregated. That's too bad. But he said the reason they're segregated is because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. And he said the neighborhoods in Louisville and Seattle are segregated. The term he used was de facto, not by government action, but because of private prejudice and private uh, businesses and the uh, economy and self-choice and income differences. And he said, well, you have segregation that was not created by government, then government is prohibited from doing something explicit to try to undo it. Well, I read this decision, as I said, one of the two school districts was Louisville, Kentucky. And I remembered reading about something else that happened in Louisville some years before. There was a white homeowner in a single family home in a suburb of Louisville, of all white suburb of single family homes. The suburb was called Shively. The white homeowner had a friend, an African-American living in the center city of Louisville, a decorated Navy veteran, had a wife and a child wanted to buy a home in a white neighborhood. Nobody would sell him one. So the um, white homeowner in this suburb of Shively bought a second home and resold it to his African-American friend. And when the African-American family moved in, an angry mob protected by the police uh, surrounded the home, threw rocks through the windows. The police made no effort to stop this. Uh, dynamited and firebombed the home. Police made no effort to stop that either. But when the riot was all over, the state of Kentucky arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed with a 15-year sentence, the white homeowner for sedition. I said to myself, this doesn't sound to me much like de facto segregation. If the police, the prosecutors, the judges, the courts, the entire judicial system, all agents of the state, are mobilized in an effort to preserve racial boundaries in Louisville. I looked into it further and I found that it wasn't just Louisville. It wasn't just a border state like Louisville. It was the South Bay of San Francisco where these violent incidences occurred. It was Denver, it was Kansas City and Chicago and Detroit and New York and Boston, hundreds and hundreds of cases of mob violence designed to drive African-Americans out of homes, which they had legitimately purchased or rented in previously all white neighborhoods, protected by the police, the mob violence, frequently organized and led by the police. Each one of these instances where the police was involved was a 14th Amendment violation, a civil rights violation, that we have an obligation as American citizens to remedy, but we've never accepted this obligation. And I began to look into it further at this point and um, discovered that, that there were many, many federal, state, and local policies. It wasn't just state-sponsored violence. Many, many federal, state, and local policies all designed to ensure that uh, on a racially explicit basis that African-Americans and whites could not live near one another in any metropolitan area anywhere in the country. Let me describe one of them to you in my book, The Color of Law. I go through many of them. I can't, uh, I don't have time to go through many of them today, but I'll describe one. Um, in the post-World War II period, the federal government embarked on a program to move the entire white population out of single, out of urban areas um, in um, cities all across the country into single family homes in all white suburbs. It was a racially explicit program. Uh, it was closed to African-Americans. It was a program to move the whites out of cities into white suburbs that would create a white noose 
around every metropolitan area of the country. At the time, uh, both whites and African Americans were living in urban areas, frequently integ in integrated neighborhoods. We'd be stunned if we were transported back to that period of time to see the extent of integration that existed. Uh, it existed because we were a manufacturing economy. I know in San Mateo, may that, that may be hard to imagine, but uh, we were making things. Uh, we had factories that needed to be located near deep water ports and railroad terminals to uh, get their parts and ship their final products. And workers, uh, whether at the factories or at the banks that service those factories or any of the other surrounding industries, they didn't have uh, automobiles to drive in from the suburbs. The only people living in suburbs were affluent people. They were walking to work, taking short streetcar rides. And so they lived in broadly the same neighborhoods, but the federal government decided to move the whites out of those neighborhoods, along with returning World War II veterans who were white, uh, not the African-American veterans, move them into single family homes in all white suburbs. This was a racially explicit program. Uh, in the South Bay of uh, 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 San Francisco, uh, Westlake, for example, would be one example, but there were many, many others. Uh, the, um, uh, on the East Coast, Levittown is probably the most famous. The uh, developer of Westlake was a man named Henry Dolger, the developer of, of Levittown was William Levitt. These developers could never have assembled the capital to um, uh, buy the land and build the uh, projects uh, uh, that, that were as large as they were. 17,000 homes uh, in Levittown, 15,000 in, in the Westlake. Uh, throughout the, the San Francisco Bay Area, there were many of these other projects. Um, the only way they could get, no bank would be crazy enough, let me say, to lend them the money to do these things because we weren't a suburban country at the time and the banks thought that nobody was going to want to move to these places. The only way that Levitt and Dolger or uh, David Buchanan, another South Bay uh, developer, the only way they could develop the capital to um, build the, the homes, uh, buy the land, was to go to the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration, submitting the plans for the development, uh, the architectural design of the homes, the materials, construction materials they're going to use, the layout of the streets, and an explicit commitment never to sell a home to an African-American. The um, uh, federal government even required Levitt and Dolger and these other developers to place a clause in the deed of every home prohibiting resale to African-Americans or rental to African-Americans. This was a racially explicit program uh, it was not the action of rogue bureaucrats working at the Federal Housing Administration or Veterans Administration. The FHA had a manual that it distributed to appraisers all over the country whose job it was to um, evaluate the applications of developers uh, who wanted uh, federal bank guarantees for their pro projects. Uh, the manual said you couldn't recommend for a federal bank guarantee a project that was going to be um, selling homes to African-Americans. You couldn't even recommend for a federal bank guarantee an all-white project if it was going to be located near where African-Americans were living. Because in the words of the manual, and I'm quoting, that would run the risk of infiltration by inharmonious racial groups. That's what the federal policy manual said. Uh, this notion of de facto segregation is other nonsense. Uh, this was a government-created Apartheid system, creating, as I say, a white noose around every metropolitan area of the country. Um, in my book, The Color of Law, I have a photograph of a six foot high, half mile long concrete wall. The developer in a, in a um, project, a developer of a project in the Detroit area, Detroit, Michigan area, was required by the Federal Housing Administration to construct, to separate his project from a nearby African-American neighborhood. And unless he constructed that, the Federal Housing Administration was not going to guarantee his bank loans. That's how rigid the federal government's design to create segregation was. Well, that policy, and there were many, many others, as I said. Uh, well, I'll, let me give you this example um, from, from your community, uh, not far from you. Um, after World War II, 
uh, Stanford University recruited the great novelist uh, Wallace Stegner to come to teach writing at Stanford. Um, in those days, uh, college professors weren't paid the way they are paid today. They were paid more like high school teachers or construction workers or mail carriers. They were middle class workers and, and he couldn't find any housing for his family when he came to Stanford. So he joined a cooperative of um, middle class people like himself who, were, who bought a tract of land outside Stanford uh, and planned to build 400 homes on that tract of land for middle class families like themselves. Uh, they went to a bank to get uh, many banks to get um, a loan to buy the land and build the homes. The banks refused to give them a loan to issue a loan. And the reason was that the Federal Housing Administration refused to insure those loans because Wallace Stegner's cooperative uh, included three African-American families. And unless those three African-American families were expelled from the cooperative, the Federal Housing Administration wouldn't guarantee the loans for this project. Um, eventually, the, um, uh, the cooperative dissolved because it refused to expel its three African-American members. The land was sold to a private developer who placed uh, clauses in the deed of every home prohibiting resale to African-Americans. With that uh, deed clause, it got FHA guarantees uh, uh, loans for its project, and it was created as a segregated project that's uh, still there today. It's called Ladera. Um, this is how it worked. There were other policies as well um, that the federal government followed. Uh, uh, I'll mention one other in, in, the, in, the, in the San Francisco Bay Area, and that is that um, during World War II, hundreds of thousands of workers, white and black, flocked to the Bay Area of San Francisco and indeed to places all over the West Coast to take jobs in war industries that hadn't existed prior to World War II. Uh, shipyards in particular, aircraft carrier, after aircraft factories. Um, they overwhelmed these migrant workers, black and white, overwhelmed the communities uh, where they migrated to. The federal government uh, uh, needed to provide housing if it wanted the ships and the airplanes to be produced. And so it did. In San Francisco, the federal government built five projects for shipyard workers. Four were for whites only. One was for African-Americans placed in the Fillmore District, and that became the black neighborhood of San Francisco. In the East Bay, uh, Richmond, uh, the Kaiser shipyards employed um, uh, thousands and thousands of workers. Uh, the federal government had to buy, build housing for it, for them. It did in uh, Berkeley and Albany, just south of um, Berkeley. The federal government built a project on the um, east side of the project were buildings for whites only near the residential area of Berkeley and, and Albany and near the shopping areas. On the west side of the project, along the railroad tracks uh, uh, and uh, in the manufacturing areas, uh, it built a project for black workers far from uh, shopping or residential areas. This was a policy the federal government followed all over the country. Well, um, uh, I know that we, we started a bit late, so I'm going to uh, uh, not uh, go into as much detail as I plan to leave time for questions. But um, let me just say that the policies to redress segregation are well known. There's no mystery about them. Policy experts, um, uh, housing experts know what we should do. <clears throat> What's missing are not policy ideas. What's missing is a new civil rights movement that's going to take the kinds of aggressive action that the civil rights movement of the 1960s took to um, redress segregation. Um, as a result of the um, national discussion that we've been having recently about racial inequality, the legacies of slavery and Jim Crow, and greater awareness of this history, a group of national civil rights leaders have come together to create something they call a new movement to redress racial segregation. Uh, that uh, uh, new movement has not yet launched, but it will launch soon. Its aim is to create local committees, local civil rights groups and communities like yours uh, to uh, uh, take action 
to make it uncomfortable to maintain the patterns of segregation that we have in this country. I can give you some examples of policies we should follow. Uh, they're all reasonable, all constitutionally required, in fact, but there's not enough political support at this point to enact them. And there won't be <clears throat> without a new civil rights movement to create that political support. The federal government, for example, should be buying up homes in these suburbs that were inexpensive when they were first um, created by the federal government for whites only, but now are unaffordable to working class families of either race. The white families who bought those homes in the mid 20th century uh, with FHA and VA guarantees uh, paid um, only about $100,000 for those homes in today's money. Uh, today, they uh, those homes go for $400,000, $500,000, $600,000, and in your community in some places, a um, million dollars or more. The federal government should be buying up those homes at market rates and reselling them at deeply discounted rates to African Americans. The white families who bought those homes gained wealth from the appreciation and the value of those homes over the next few generations. They sent their children to college with that wealth. They uh, took care of uh, temporary emergencies, maybe medical emergencies or unemployment. They subsidized their retirements and they bequeathed wealth to their children and grandchildren who then had down payments for their own homes. African-Americans were prohibited from participating in this wealth generating program. The only uh, remedy for this, and it's constitutionally required, although there's no political support for it, would be for the federal government to subsidize African-Americans, to move to communities that were, from which they were excluded when they were affordable and which are now unaffordable to working class families, either black or white, unless they have inherited down payments from their parents or grandparents. At the low end of the income scale, we uh, uh, pursue policies that reinforce segregation today. Uh, these policies also should be reformed. The biggest program we have for creating housing for low income families who are disproportionately African American and Hispanic is the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. It's a tax credit that's issued by the Federal Treasury Department, distributed to states, and then in turn distributed to uh, nonprofit developers who then um, build uh, uh, projects for low-income families. The Treasury Department regulations place a premium on um, placing those projects in existing low-income neighborhoods, reinforcing their segregation. It's crazy, it's backwards. Of course, we should be building better housing in those neighborhoods. We also should be creating opportunities for families who wish to do so to move to higher opportunity communities where there's um, access to better jobs and transportation, clean air, uh, supermarkets that sell fresh food, schools that aren't overwhelmed by the social and economic problems of their children. That's where we should be placing more of these low-income housing tax credit units. We're not doing so simply because there's no political support in um, communities like yours for doing so. Uh, we have a, a, a program called the Section 8 program, which um, with which you uh, are probably familiar with. It's a subsidy program for um, uh, low-income families to help them rent uh, homes, apartments, uh, in, um, uh, that they otherwise couldn't afford without these subsidies. The subsidy is calculated to be able to afford uh, the rent at the median rent of the metropolitan area. Well, it uh, doesn't take a genius to figure out that the median rent in the metropolitan area is gonna be too low to rent in a higher opportunity community and actually too high to rent in a low income segregated community. Landlords in low income neighborhoods exploit the program by charging more than the um, uh, market would require in the absence of these subsidies. The subsidies should be adjusted so that they're higher to um, rent an apartment or a home in um, a, a high opportunity community and lower uh, than is necessary, uh, that's, that's what's required to rent in a low income segregated neighborhood. So the reforms that we should pursue, I, I say, are well-known. What's missing is not policy ideas. 
What's missing is a new civil rights movement that's going to make it uncomfortable to maintain the patterns of segregation, as I said, an apartheid system of residential neighborhoods that we have today. Um, as I said, I'm working with a group of um, civil rights and fair housing leaders across the country to create something we call a new movement to redress racial segregation, whose role it will be to create local committees, civil rights groups and communities like yours all over the country to um, take action to redress segregation. Um, I, uh, I can make available to you, maybe I'll put it in the chat or maybe you can distribute it to registrants uh, for this uh, a webinar. I can make available to you a link uh, so that you can get notified if you're interested in participating in this new movement to redress racial segregation. And if you do um, join us in this effort, I will very much appreciate the opportunity to work with you. With that, I want to thank you. And um, uh, I will take a second to put the information about how to do this in the chat. But would be, meanwhile, we'll be glad to answer your questions. Thank you. Fantastic. Richard, that was such a rich overview. And I really appreciated that um, as the author, you spent some time also uh, sort of detailing what are some of the things that we can do to turn the tide on, uh, on history. I do have a number of questions. Uh, and let's just jump in with the first one because our time is uh, limited. Mm -hmm. Right now, cities across California are going through general plan updates, and cities are deciding how to zone for increased housing requirements. There's been increasing talk in city councils in the Bay Area, such as Berkeley, about allowing modestly dense housing to be built in single-family neighborhoods, given that single-family neighborhoods were adopted specifically to implement racial segregation in a way that was consistent with the law. What do you say to residents of predominantly white, wealthier, single family neighborhoods who are worried about their quality of life, their investment, the quality of their neighborhood, and are opposing these sorts of policy changes? Well, um... I, I don't have time to, to explain why each of these fears is unfounded. Um, we certainly know that uh, in the places where um, uh, we have done the kind of thing you're talking about, people's quality of life has not deteriorated. Their property values have not fallen. Crime has not increased. Uh, schools have not become overburdened. But um, it's not a question of reason. Uh, it's uh, when you answer these questions, people will come up with other excuses for not uh, wanting to desegregate their neighborhoods. So the answer I give is that um, we need a new civil rights movement that's going to raise the temperature of this issue in the community. Of course, we should have pri quiet conversations with opponents and explain the things I've just described but quiet uh, conversations are not enough. I have put into the chat a um, uh, link to uh, uh, where you can, uh, that you can use to um, get information about the new movement to redress racial segregation. And um, uh, I hope that you will uh, join me and others uh, around the country in creating these local committees to um, make it uncomfortable to maintain these patterns of segregation. Excellent, thank you for that. Uh, and you have another question, which is, thank you for this enlightening book. As an American of Japanese ancestry, I'm well aware of color restrictions in San Mateo where Japanese Americans were not allowed to live west of El Camino Real. And thus the community grew along Humboldt Avenue near First. This is why the Buddhist temple is located there. David Bohannon developed and constructed many, many homes, all with racial restrictions in San Mateo and became extremely wealthy. In the 1950s, Joseph Eichler designed and built a few tracks on the peninsula with no racial restrictions for buyers. The fact that his developments were not restricted was the main reason a friend of ours, uh, who was a World War II vet, 
bought, bought one of his homes in San Mateo Highlands when they were new. Do you know how Eichler was able to finance these tracks and keep them open to all races? Well, um, yes, I do. And Eichler's, um, uh, hold on, I'm putting something else into the chat. Uh, give me half a second. Yeah, <laughs> Busy okay. chat. There. Uh, well, I can't do I can't do two things at once. Uh, I'm not uh, I'm not young enough to do that. I apologize. Okay. Uh, the thing that uh, the thing that distinguished the Eichler homes from uh, the Bohannon homes is that the Eichler homes were sold to a much a higher income group than the Bohannon homes. The Eichler homes were very unusual. They were they were uh, uh, you know at the time most people um, upper middle class people. Uh, custom built their own homes. There weren't these kinds of subdivisions for uh, middle class people. And uh, that's what Eichler built. That's what made him unique. He was also very careful. He made sure when he sold a home to a non-Caucasian that it was not anywhere near another home that he is, was selling to a non-Caucasian. So he was very careful to spread them out um, in his development. But the main thing is that Bohannon was building a um, a uh, uh, pro building projects. And well, I just put in the chat, by the way, I'm sure most of you are already familiar with this. I wrote an article in the New York Times about your community um, in August uh, about uh, David, how David Bohannon created the segregation of your community. And um, uh, uh, some, I just, um, I just, I'm sorry, I just saw that somebody says that um, my, my chats are not visible to attendees. No, my, my chats are, are to all panelists and attendees. So if you look at the links, I'll also, I, I assume people have registered for this uh, webinar and I can send you these links so you can follow up with them and send them out to the registrants um, Excellent. Uh, That'd be great. La later as well. But in any event, what I'm saying is Bohannon was building um, projects for returning war veterans, for uh, working class families. Uh, lower middle class families. Eichler was building for a somewhat higher income group. And that's why he was able to get away with this. Understood. Okay. On another topic, what do you think of the policy of the city of Berkeley to discontinue building of single family homes? Do you think this is the start of our cities, other cities, excuse me, recognizing the need to change zoning so affordable housing will be built? Well, I don't think Berkeley is discontinuing building single family homes. I think what they're doing is considering changing zoning so that anything but single family homes is no longer prohibited. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a necessary first step for any community to take, but it itself will not uh, accomplish much racial desegregation. Um, Berkeley is the kind of hot market where um, uh, typically, if you build townhouses or condominiums rather than single family homes, they'll still be out of the price range of families without inherited wealth or who are not uh, wealthy for some other reason. So um, abolishing single family zoning is a necessary first step, but uh, that alone will not uh, desegregate Berkeley. In order to create significant progress in the area of racial uh, desegregation. We need racially explicit policies. We need subsidies for people who were unconstitutionally denied access to these communities when they were affordable. And uh, simply um, uh, race neutral policies, such as uh, abolishing single family zoning are a step in that direction, but they won't accomplish it on its, in itself. Understood. So what is allowed in local communities versus the state versus the federal to create equal housing? And how does someone get involved with you in this movement? And I do want you to clarify, do you perceive yourself to be leading a movement or do you perceive yourself to be educating others uh, to create movement? Well, I'm not leading a movement and I'm too old to even if I wanted to. <laughs> But um, I am working with a group of national civil rights leaders and I put this link in the chat and it's to panelists and attendees. 
um, and I will send it to you um, or to the organizer of this webinar uh, tomorrow so that you can distribute it by email to everybody who's uh, registered for this program. Uh, what we are doing is creating a structure where local um, citizens can create committees. We're going to be hiring organizers and um, researchers. They're going to support uh, local groups that want to take action in their own communities to um, uh, redress segregation. And while they're doing it, I'm going to be writing another book. Amazing. <laughs> So, next question. Given the difficulty for Black people of accumulating wealth by owning homes that are valued the same as comparable homes by white people, do you think we could start to calculate government paid reparations for Black people? And can you expand on the constitutional requirements for housing reparations? Well, I don't, um, I don't use the term reparations, uh, really, because I think most people misunderstand it. They think of it as a, um, you know, as, as a, a single monetary payment to the um, uh, current generation. It would inevitably be token. Uh, this is a multi-generational problem. It was created um, generation after generation. It's additive and it can't be solved with a single payment. What we need is something much broader than reparations. We need policies of a variety of, some of them would be um, inexpensive. Some of them would be very expensive. The program I talked about earlier of the government buying up homes from which uh, African-Americans were excluded uh, in the uh, mid 20th century and reselling them at deeply discounted prices. I think that's a narrowly targeted remedy for a very specific constitutional violation. It would be quite expensive, uh, but uh, I think it's constitutionally justifiable. It's an affirmative action program in housing. There are other policies that uh, would cost anything at all. Mm -hmm. It doesn't cost anything, for example, to adjust Section 8 voucher payments so that they're higher in higher opportunity neighborhoods and lower in lower opportunity neighborhoods. Uh, that would be a no cost uh, program that um, would uh, help to desegregate neighbors. So some things would be cost-free, others would be quite expensive. We need a full range of policies and the focus on reparations, I think, takes our attention away from the, the very complicated work of, of developing policies and support for them. Understood, thank you for that. Where did the impetus for federal policies and programs promoting segregation originate? Was this a function of the political power of Dixiecrats and the New Deal and other democratic administrations or something else altogether? No, I think that the role of the Dixiecrats in the New Deal is exaggerated in most people's understanding. The policies of segregation were policies throughout the Democratic Party, North and South. Um, I don't want to take a lot of time because we don't have a lot of time left, but in my book, I talk about how in 1913, Woodrow Wilson, who was the first democratic segregationist Southern president since the Civil War, embarked on a program to um, segregate the federal civil service. And um, uh, previously the federal service had been integrated. The federal civil service had been integrated. Um, and uh, under Wilson's program, uh, curtains were placed in uh, the federal uh, office buildings separating black and white workers. Black civil servants who were supervising whites were fired because that was no longer permitted. Separate washing facilities were created in basements for um, African-American civil servants. Well, one of the largest federal departments at that time was the Navy Department. And as I describe in my book, the official responsible for segregating the Navy Department in 1939, in 1913, was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, whose name was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So this was the environment in which Roosevelt matured as a democratic politician. Uh, it was accepted, segregation was accepted throughout the Democratic Party. It wasn't just a Southern phenomenon. Thank you for that. So I have a couple more, and I think given the time, we might have question uh, time for 
maybe two more questions. So this one is, how has racist housing policy specifically affected San Francisco, San Francisco Bay Area, and led to the over-representation of the Black and Indigenous people of color community and those experiencing homelessness? Well, I think, uh, I don't want to take a lot of time because we don't have a lot of time, but I described the specific things I, I deliberately focused on, on issues in the Bay Area in my talk. I talked about okay. how World War II housing for war workers was is how segregation was first created in the San Francisco Bay Area. Mm -hmm. How David Bohannon and I, that example I gave of uh, Wallace Stegner, how uh, uh, you could not develop housing that was integrated uh, so long as the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administrations were involved. So um, there were many policies in the San Francisco Bay Area that uh, created the segregation that we know today. Excellent, it's interesting. Every question that we answer uh, generates another five questions. So we're clearly not gonna get through them all, but there's a couple more here. So what would you say to people who say their neighborhoods are diverse now? with different races of people living there and use that argument as a way of uh, arguing against building more homes and different types of homes in their neighborhoods? Well, diversity and desegregation are not the same thing. You know, there are, um, we need racially explicit policies to undo the unconstitutional policies of the past. Um, and those policies were in most of the country uh, specifically directed at African Americans. Uh, in the West Coast, you know, in California, in Texas, in Colorado, there was also state, not federal, but state sponsored um, segregation of um, Asian Americans and Hispanic Americans. Mm -hmm. But um, diversity is a, a term that uh, can mean many things. But we have uh, a constitutionally, uh, uh, an unconstitutional system of segregation for African Americans in particular in most of the country, and to uh, some extent um, in, in California and Texas and Colorado for some other groups. And we have to remedy those specifically. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And maybe we'll do one more and then uh, get ready to wrap up. I know it's probably getting late uh, where you are. So how might one find de facto segregation in modern build outs that exist or existed after the time of redlining and exclusionary racial covenants? Well, once you have a segregated system, once you create with public policy a segregated system, race neutral policies can reinforce it. And so, um, there's no once once you have two different communities with different economic and social circumstances that were created in an unconstitutional fashion, it's impossible to have a policy that doesn't affect each of them differently. So, for example, one of the things I wrote a column about recently, an article about recently in the New York Times, in addition to the one that um, was about your community, is I wrote about Syracuse, New York. Uh, and I can also give you the link to this and you can um, distribute it uh, by email to attendees. In Syracuse, for example, uh, there were, um, they hadn't done a property reassessment. The tax assessor hadn't done a property reassessment for 25 years. In the intervening 25 years, properties in white neighborhoods increased in value much more rapidly than properties in black neighborhoods. So what's the result of that? Well, it wasn't a race neutral, it wasn't a racially explicit policy not to do a property reassessment. They were just lazy. They didn't want to do a prop, they wanted, didn't invest the resources in, in reassessing properties. But the result was that um, the assessed value of um, African American homes were much closer to their market value than the assessed value of white homes, which are far below their market value. The result of that was that African-Americans were paying a much, much higher share of uh, the costs of schools and libraries and fire departments and other things that um, uh, depend on property taxes uh, than whites were paying. 
this is uh, the kind of thing that a committee to redress racial segregation in Syracuse, and this is going on all over the country. I don't mean to pick on Syracuse. Um, this is the kind of thing that the committee should address. It should be mobilizing a campaign, not only to uh, reduce the property taxes in black neighborhoods and increase them in white neighborhoods to a fair ratio, but there should also be a recon compensation for the uh, families who for two decades were paying a disproportionate share of the costs of, of, um, of public services simply because they lived in African-American neighborhoods. So this is a, an example of a race neutral policy that builds on top of a segregated system and uh, reinforces segregation and further uh, depresses the conditions of African-American neighborhoods. I love, um, I just love the reflections that you have shared with this audience over the last hour. What a way to end a, a, a work day. Uh, I, I frequently say that one of my uh, greatest and most uh, proud strengths is love of learning. And, um, and inside of this one hour, I think we've taken in so many amazing insights from you. I, um, the thing I remember saying when I posted about this in my, um, in my social net network was not just that we would spend the time learning and reflecting because that's important, um, but that, that the more important thing was that we look into this history that we've created and figure out how we repair it, how we make it different, how we make it better. And for those of us who are policymakers and for those of us who are community organizers and for those of us who um, are about leading movements, you've given us so many great insights to, uh, to leap forward from. So I want to, to you, Richard, say thank you. Thank you so much for your diligence. Thank you so much for your insight. Thank you so much for your transparency and thank you so much for your truth. And for everyone who joined in the audience today, thank you for joining us this evening. If you enjoyed this author and you look forward to hearing from others who have similar contributions inside of this uh, space and focus on equity, please check out our future author events and we'll post the link in the chat now so that everyone can see that. We'd also appreciate if you could tell us uh, how the San Mateo County Library did with this particular program. And we'll post the link for uh, survey feedback in the chat session as well. Again, Richard, thank you so much for your time and for your talent, for your truth, and for helping us all see more clearly how we can be even more impactful in repairing our past so that we can create a more equitable future. Thank you very much, Regina. And thanks to all of you for engaging with me in this this evening. Mm -hmm.